echo something that Josh mentioned just a few moments ago. Uh, students, uh, enjoy your time here. These are some of the greatest years of your life, being surrounded by faithful men uh, who are communicating God's precious truths to you. Uh, enjoy that and showing you also how to live a godly life. I love the, the lectureship that we've had thus far. Um, I was jokingly mentioning that I have a hard time listening to the sermons that come before mine because I see all the stuff that I didn't get to go through and dig into that helps give me context for my lesson. So there's a, there's a part of me that, that doesn't like that. I'm, oh, I missed it. But there's another part of me that says, but I love it. I love the lesson yesterday morning, seeing John 1 and, and seeing Jesus, God coming in the flesh to dwell with man and the sorrow of man's rejection, how that this letter was written to hopefully give those who had rejected Christ another opportunity, another chance to receive the Christ whom they had rejected. I want to start off by, by thanking the congregation here for providing this nourishment, this banquet, this feast of God's word. We certainly want to thank God for his nourishment that he has given us through his word. I also want to set forth my mission here this morning. As 1 Peter 4.11 teaches, If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do as according to the abilities which God has given, that God in all things may be glorified. That's our mission here this morning. It is to glorify God by speaking His Word so that we can go out into the world and live it. And finally, I want to mention the, uh, the scope of the lesson this morning as an introductory matter. There is far too much information, as I had already alluded to, to cover, whether it be the historical, the geographical, whatever it is, there is way too much to cover here, so we will be leaving out Quite a bit of information, as Josh alluded to. John 4. I want to start by putting it in its context. We understand the main theme of the book of John, and that is found in John 20, 30, and 31. That these things were written for this purpose. What purpose? To develop belief inside of man that Jesus is the Christ so that God could provide life through faith in Him. That's our overarching text. That's our overarching context to which John 4 attaches itself. Here in John 4, and I love seeing this, I don't remember which instructor had mentioned this, but as you look into the books of the Bible, as you read throughout the Bible, the Bible is more like a tapestry where you can see the thread that is woven into the very fabric of that central red line the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and everything is interwoven with that. 
And you see those themes come up and they'll disappear for a little bit and then they'll come back again. And one of those themes that, that, run, that runs alongside of the main theme of the book of John is the idea that Jesus has life within himself. And that he has the ability to give this life to all those who come to him. You see that from the very beginning in John chapter 1. In John chapter 1, it mentions there that, that he is the light of men. That he has life within himself. John 1 verse 4, in him was life and the life was the light of men. You see that at the very, at the very end, we already mentioned John chapter 20 verses 30 and 31, that through faith in him we might have everlasting life. You can go throughout the book of John, John chapter 2, John chapter 3, you can continue to go through here and you can see that idea brought up again and again and again. And it's no difference in John 4. God wants us to see through John 4 that Jesus is who we need for life. Is who all men need for life. One more theme. And I love this one. I've been, I've been looking at the pictures that God has in his word. And God loves his pictures. It helps man see Jesus from a little different perspective. And as you look through the book of John, he's going to be giving us pictures of Jesus as Christ. Who is he? In John chapter 6, he's the bread of life. In John chapter 11, he is the resurrection. In John chapter 15, he is the true vine. And you go throughout the book of John over and over. He's the Lamb of God. He's the light. He's the Word. He, all of these things. He is the Good Shepherd. And here in John 4, God gives us another picture of Jesus as the Christ. And that is that He is the well of living water. That's going to be our focus here this morning. Jesus is the well of living water. And with these pictures, God emphasizes a different perspective of Jesus as the Christ. And, and in, in this one, in John 4, is the well of living water. It, it's a theme that connects with several other pictures. And that is that Jesus is the spiritual nourishment that we need for our lives. You look at, at John 6 where he says that I am the bread of life. And what do you have to do? He says you have to partake of me. You have to partake of my words if you want to have the life that I provide. You look at John chapter 15. What is he there? He's the true vine. And he says, hey, in, in order for you to have the nourishment, you have to have yourselves attached to me. You have to abide in the vine in order to have life and in order to bear fruit. Jesus is the well of living water who provides life to all those who come to him. In John chapter 4, as we begin diving into the text here, Jesus uh, is traveling to Galilee, back to Galilee, and going through Samaria, and we're not going to get into the uh, into the depths of the ge geographical idea, but uh, speaking geographically, it is the easiest route to go from uh, Jerusalem, Judea, and that area, and to go straight north through Samaria. Many Jews, of course, would circumvent this to go around uh, the land of the Samaritans. But as he is passing through Samaria, uh, he begins to become tired, it says uh, he's hungry and he's thirsty. And what you see here is a little bit of the picture of Jesus' humanity. Yes, he was fully God, but at the same time, he was fully man. 
so he, he becomes tired. And as they're passing through um, Shechem, or what is called here in, in John 4 and verse 5, Sychar, as they are passing through Sychar, they pass near that, that portion of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. And we don't have any information about Jacob's well really in the Old Testament. I was like, oh, well, there has to be some type of... No, this is, this is where it's at. If you want to know about Jacob's well, it's right here. <laughs> and maybe some, some historical uh, stuff in the history books. But this is about all the information that we get about Jacob's well. And so Jesus is weary there in verse 6. And he, he sits upon the well. And it's about the six hours. So guess what? It's about this time. Jewish, Jewish time works this way. The six hours is about 12 o'clock thereabouts. If this is Jewish time. And so he's, he's tired. He's weary. He's hungry. He's thirsty. And he's sitting on the well. Uh, uh, Jacob's well. And a woman of Samaria comes. And he says to her, give me drink. We want to make a quick note here. Uh, the Jews and Samaritans, of course, did not have a very good relationship. Uh, we're not going to get into the large historical context here, but basically what had happened was uh, after the Israelites had been removed from their land, people from other nations were brought in and were settled in their lands, and uh, the Jews, upon returning, intermingled and married with the people there. Um, the uh, the Assyrians had had sent back a Jew to help the people that were in the land understand how to worship God, and what they did was they they intermingled the gods of their nations with the God, and they intermingled their worship, how they worshipped their gods with God's worship, and, and so really they became a a mixed breed a type of mutt, if you will. And that was how the Jews really perceived them, as unclean, tainted mutts. And so she asks, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Now, as far as I understand, this is not just a societal norm. I believe Acts chapter 10 verse 28, and I could be wrong, so check me out on this, but Acts chapter 10 and verse 28, Peter uh, speaks a very relevant truth to this matter. And he said unto them, You know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man which is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation, but God has showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. So I think what has happened here is just like what the Jews did with the Sabbath and other laws is they took God's law that was meant for one uh, specific purpose over here and they pushed it to the extreme. <laughs> God initially gave laws concerning the idea of not mixing uh, with the people of the land to, to make sure that the people of the land didn't take their hearts away from God and to their own gods. Uh, but these people have taken it to an extreme and have said, we can't have anything to do. It is forbidden. It is against the law. So in this woman's mind, Jesus is, is an anomaly to her. He is someone who is breaking what she considers to be the law of the Jews. So why? Why was it okay for Jesus to break? Why was Jesus okay with breaking the law of the Jews? Here it is, verse 10. The salvation of the soul is more important than the preservation of cultural norms. Let's establish that idea in our hearts. As I was growing up, the cultural standard was, there's two things you don't talk about. Politics and religion. And that's still pretty much the standard today. 
If you want to have a relationship with somebody, if you want to keep from driving people away from you, then do not be divisive by talking about politics and religion. Jesus was not of that mentality as far as the religion is concerned. He dabbled in politics just a little bit, <laughs> giving some godly advice. Jesus does not outright answer her question, but he points her in the direction that she needs to be pointed in. In verse 10 he says, If you knew the gift of of God, and who it is that saith unto thee, Give me drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living waters. Now let's make this clear. Jesus is not speaking to the woman at the well because he needs for her to provide for him. This is, as John 1 said, the creator of all things. Jesus has already shown his authority over the elements of nature by changing water into wine. Jesus is not approaching her because of his physical need. He is approaching the woman because he sees her spiritual need. And he is using his physical need in order to create an opportunity to provide for her. That's hard. As an evangelist who is a human, who is fallible, that's hard to see that. Because it makes me hurt when I say, how many times have I been so entrenched in what I want that I neglected the need of someone around me? We need to develop a view of others and a proper view of others and a proper view of our needs, our wants. And we need to control our needs in such a way that they never hinder us from seeing the spiritual needs of others. This woman needs salvation. And this is a beautiful picture. Like I said, I love the, the lectures that we've already been through because it really helped me see God. And I love looking at these pictures. When I see Jesus in the temple, what do you see? You see God in his house. This is my house. When you see Jesus with the woman at the well, what do you see? You see the father communicating with his child. Verses 11 and 12. The woman is intrigued. Her, her interest is piqued. And she doesn't quite know what to make of Jesus yet. Said, where are you going to get this water from? The well is deep. You don't have anything to draw with. Are you greater than our father Jacob, which gave us this well, and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? Um... That 
is irony. Could you imagine sitting face to face with Jesus, with God in the flesh, and not, not knowing who he was? Are you greater than one of my great forefathers? Anyone reading the book of John up until this point would emphatically answer, Yes! This is God in the flesh. This is verse 3, John 1, 3. The one who made all things. This is the one who has life within himself. Who gave life to man. This is the Lamb of God. This is the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. Are you greater than our father Jacob? Not only is Jesus greater of necessity by his nature, by who he is. But look at those three points there. Greater than our father who gave us this will, I want you to ask, who was it that made Jacob great? It was God. Who is it that's Jacob's father? It's him. Who was it that gave Jacob the will? The land that blessed him. It's ironic that you should ask that. <laughs> Once again, Jesus does not answer her question directly. And, and it's something that I've just noticed. I love this. He's not going to be direct with her until the very end of their conversation. <laughs> but he is still answering her questions nonetheless. Am I greater than your father Jacob? He begins to compare and contrast those ideas. He says, if you drink this water again, or excuse me, if you drink this water, you will thirst again. Yes, Jacob's well does provide temporary physical nourishment. That is correct. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Verse 10 and verse 14 reveal a truth concerning our souls. That within every man... That within every physical body of man, there is a spirit, a spiritual being. And that spiritual being has a place for God. That spirit... It longs to be filled with the presence of God. And it needs the presence of God. It needs God's word. It needs God's will. To provide for the spiritual necessities. And in order to have life. Isn't that the same way with our body? Are you hungry? It's getting close to 12. I have, I, I've had a habit that, that I've developed where I, I realized, you know, I was putting on some weight, and I was like, I, even though I'm a skinny guy, but I was like, oh, I was putting on some weight, and I started thinking about how much we intake in our lives, our physical bodies, and I said, you know what? I don't really need three meals a day. By 12 o'clock, I'm hungry. My body needs physical nourishment. It longs for physical nourishment. And it needs it in order to live. That's what Jesus is comparing here. 
In the same way, our spirits need God's Word. It needs God in our lives. And this was so sad to me. As a father, I struggle. I think we all do. As an imperfect human. To provide my children the, the nourishment that they need in their lives. But reading this, seeing this, looking at Jesus' perspective of another human being. And looking at that individual and saying, you have spiritual needs. You thirst, you desire, you crave my word. You crave to have a relationship with me. And I can give that to you. You can fill your children's life with television. You can sit them in front of the couch. You can take them on lavish trips. Oh, I, I have to show my children the world. There's so much to experience. You can give your child the best education that money has to buy. You can make your child an athlete. But it doesn't matter what you do for your child in this life. As long as you are refusing, as long as you are neglecting, as long as I am neglecting to give my child God's word, they are malnourished. They're starving. They're hungry for something. Jesus as God in the flesh has come down to provide that life that is within him, saying, do you want spiritual nourishment? I have the living water. Do you want satisfaction, true satisfaction? Even Christians, we don't even have to go to the world. Yes, they're unsatisfied. Yes, they're unfulfilled. Even Christians... We go being unsatisfied, feeling unfulfilled. Because we're not feeding on His Word. Because we're not doing His will. Jesus says, if you partake of the water that I give you, you will never thirst. And I love, whenever I see this, I see Snickers. I don't think they use that logo anymore, but what was it? Satisfaction guaranteed. That's what he's saying here. You want real satisfaction? It's not found in Snickers. <laughs> it's found in Jesus. This satisfaction, not only spiritual nourishment, that spiritual satisfaction, but has the ability to produce that everlasting life. Verse 15, she says, give it to me. I want it. I want this living water. But she's made a mistake. She doesn't quite understand. Just as Nicodemus didn't, and just as Peter won't, and just as oftentimes we misunderstand, what, what's he talking about? She thinks he's talking about that physical water. Hey, give me this physical water that I don't come here to draw from Jacob's well anymore. I want you to notice this, verse 16 through 18. And you say, well, how does verse 16 through 18, Jesus bringing up her marital relationship, how does that attach itself to that idea that Jesus is the Christ who is the well of living water, who provides spiritual nourishment unto spiritual satisfaction unto everlasting life? How does it attach itself to that? Because we as humans, without knowledge, we don't know how to fill that void in our life. 
And so what we do is we reach out to all of the things in the world and we're thinking, this will fulfill me. This will, will, will satisfy me in some way. It will bring meaning to my life. You know, Solomon, in his wisdom, said something to this nature that a man who, who gets silver will not be satisfied with getting. <laughs> it doesn't satisfy. It never can. Jesus is not changing the subject matter at hand. He's not changing the main point. But what he is saying is a specific application of the problem that she has. Because she has this hole in her soul that longs to be filled by God, she's looking for satisfaction in her specific way that, that, that's manifesting in her life. One of the ways is by her going from relationship to relationship to relationship to relationship, and the, the relationship that she's in now isn't even her husband. What's she trying to do? The same thing that we all do. When we think that I'm not satisfied, well, what do I have to do? I want satisfaction. Well, something has to change. What has to change? Well, it's this. And we pick one thing in our lives that, that the world has helped us center around, and we pick that and we say, okay, this has to change, and we move and we get another whatever this thing is, and guess what? That doesn't satisfy us either. So we move on and on and on, continuously being unsatisfied. Now through this, we have a point that connects to the main point of John, the supernatural knowledge that Jesus had of the intimate details of this woman's personal life. When she saw that, she made the connection. She said, you're the Christ. Excuse me, you're a prophet. <laughs> We're not there yet. That will be the connection that is later made through that same point. But first, you're a prophet. This let her know that he had supernatural knowledge. That he had knowledge of the truth. And guess what? That he had knowledge of greater truth. That's why she asks him the next question. Makes the next statement. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain. And you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Once again, not to get too far into the historical background here. Um, but when the Jews came back and they were building the temple, uh, the Samaritans said, hey, let's come, we'll help you build that temple. And they said, no, you have no lot in the matter. And uh, so what is reported by history anyway um, is that the Samaritans built their own temple, their own place of worship in Gerizim. And you could see that from uh, Samaria. Uh, John Hyrcanus was the one who reportedly tore that down. But anyway, that's just some historical knowledge there. So that's basically what's going on. But I want you to notice something. When she says, our fathers, she is not referring to one or two or three generations past. No, she's already set a context for who she is speaking of. Back in verse 12, are you greater than our father Jacob. And you go back to the Old Testament, you look at Abraham, where did he worship as he was coming from his land and into a land that, that God was shown, the land of promise, where did he set up his altar? Well, it was in Shechem. And then you go to Jacob, where did he set up his altar? It was in Shechem. And you continue to go through the Old Testament and you can see that, that God's people were continuously going back to Shechem over and over again uh, to, to worship God. And so she did have some legitima legitimacy as a claim. It wasn't just, oh, well, my father told me. They, no, no, no. I'm, I'm looking back at the Old Testament that we have. The, I think it was like uh, the Samaritan Pentateuch. Uh, and, and she said, oh, all these people, they worshipped. So why don't you worship? Here? Well, she didn't have the knowledge that, that helped her understand that, that God had made a change, that God had, had said, well, I'm going to select a, a place and where I put my name, that's where you're going to, to worship me. And then he chose Jerusalem. 
So the Jews were right on that. Once again, Jesus doesn't answer this outright. But he gives her the general principle. <laughs> gives her the general principle. And, and you think about verse 22. Man, what an insult that would be. What a slap in the face. And, and Jesus was not afraid to be direct. We should not be afraid to be direct. I know it's hard. And it seems... Sometimes as though it is rude or offensive. But it's offensive in the right way. It's offensive in the idea that, that there's a topic here that could keep you from eternal life. And you need the knowledge that I have concerning that specific knowledge. Verse 23 and once again, we want to see before we, uh, before we delve into this, how does this fit to the larger context of Jesus being the well of living water who provides spiritual nourishment unto spiritual salvation, uh, satisfaction and everlasting life? How does this connect to that? Well, I want you to notice an idea here, that our spirit does not only find satisfaction in serving God, but it finds satisfaction in having our service accepted by him. You go over to Genesis chapter 4 and verse 5. Here God is, is looking at Cain and Abel's sacrifice, and it says that he accepted uh, Abel's sacrifice, but he did not accept Cain's. And what happened? And he became wrath, and his countenance was fallen. Spiritually, he was devastated. Because his service to God was not acceptable. So Jesus is, is helping her understand how to make that service acceptable so that she can have that satisfaction in her soul. To have her service accepted by God he says that this service must be rendered in both spirit and in truth. And what that means, at least, I want to emphasize this, I don't know the totality of what it means to worship in spirit and in truth. I'm not that good yet. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know that I may ever. It's something that I've been searching for for years. What does that mean? But it means at least, at least this that when I serve God, it must be done in sincerity. When I say sincerity, notice what I mean here. I mean that the inner being must be participated with a sincere heart that is attempting to glorify God. And we want to look at an example of this in Matthew chapter 6. Jesus said that these men were doing the right things. They were giving they were praying. They were fasting. But inside, they were seeking for glory of men. And so they could not have their service accepted in God's sight. But the flip is true. You have this woman who is apparently, she's sincere. She's sincere enough to accept that Jesus is the Christ when he comes to her. He says, sincerity is not enough. We need both spirit and truth. By establishing this general principle, Jesus is affirming that truth is just as important to God as sincerity is. One more point before we go, and the lesson is yours. Quickly now, look down to verses 32 through the end of this uh, section here. Satisfaction comes from doing God's work. You hit John 4, uh, excuse me, Philippians 4, uh, 4 through 9. How do you get that peace? How do you get that joy for your soul, that peace of God? How are you able to rejoice in the Lord? Yes, it's by giving your problems over to God in prayer, letting Him deal with them at, in His time according to His will. Yes, you think on the good things of God, but also, verse 9, you do it. And what does He say? And the peace of God will be with you. 
Spiritual satisfaction. That's what we're looking for. That's what he's offering. If you want spiritual satisfaction, it can be yours today by sincerely receiving the truth of God's word, coming to him according to his truth, to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, to repent, to change your heart, that you no longer submit yourself to your own will, but you submit yourself to God's will to do it, to confess like this woman that Jesus is the Christ and to be baptized into Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. Thank you.